his morning prayers at St. Peter's, Ipswich, brought to you online, a place where we study God's word together and where we join our hearts and our voices before the throne of God, praying for the needs of our world, our church and ourselves. Welcome this morning. The Lord be with you today, Friday, the 24th of May, in the year of our Lord, 2024. Today, the Church of England commemorates the lives of John and Charles Wesley, and we'll be hearing a bit more about them and how God used them a bit later in this morning's prayer. I'm using for our time of morning prayer today this little booklet called Let Us Pray, which has been prepared by the Anglican Ch Anchor Anglican Church in Foy. Let us start with a verse of scripture. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And so we praise the Lord today in the words of the psalm. The psalm selected for this morning is Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speak lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O Lord. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you, who gives victory to kings, who rescues David his servant from the cruel sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, so shall be for ever. Amen. Amen. John and Charles Wesley were two brothers, often were two of many, and they were born... Uh, to um, their father was an Anglican clergyman and their mother was a Puritan. John Wesley was born on this day, on the 24th of May 
in 1738. It was also a time when he was um, when he entered holy orders, when he was ordained as a minister, and he began to uh, an itinerant ministry, which did not recognize parish boundaries. He he was not bound by the parish system. He traveled wherever he could, preaching the gospel. After his death, this movement that he had started of gathering people wherever he went was established then as what we know as the Methodist Church today. His personal spirituality uh, involved an Armenian uh, affirmation of grace and a frequent communion and a disciplined corporate search for holiness. What does this all mean? Uh, as in his Armenian affirmation of grace was that salvation is available to all, not every all people. Are, in other words, he was actually not subscribing to the doctrine of the election of believers or the predestination of believers. He said that we all have the choice and the ability to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and receive the grace of God, but that it is our choice eventually to do that. His open air preaching, his concern for education, he had a poor for the poor, uh, uh, he had a heart for the poor, a litur liturgical uh, revision. He organized local societies as he traveled around and he provided for the tra training of other preachers like himself. And he gave them a firm basis for Christian growth and mission in England. He provided a biblical basis for them for, to be able so that when they went out preaching, they preached from the word of God. Now Charles, his brother on the other hand, stood by him through a lot of this work and particularly in the building up of what they called the Methodist societies at that time as they travelled the country. His concern was that these new believers in Christ should remain loyal to Anglicanism. He wasn't calling them out of the Anglican Church, but prayed and his desire was they stayed within the Anglican Church and brought that revival amongst the members of that church. He married, he settled in Bristol first and then he moved to London and he concentrated his work on the local Christian communities there. But the thing that we remember about Charles is that he was a prolific hymn writer. And his hymns, hymns, his hymns are still being sung to this day. And they have a tremendous amount of, uh, of truth and celebrate God's grace uh, right, from the, right from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Even the great event of for God's work of salvation. It has rich themes of worship, of Eucharist. And there's an anticipation in the taking up of the human life and subsuming it into the divine life when Jesus returns. John died in, in 1791 and Charles had died previously in 1788. Two brothers that have affected the history of the church, the life of the church, and they have affected the, Christ, the face of Christianity, both in the United Kingdom and abroad. So we come now to our Bible reading, of, 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 which tells us of another young man who affected the history of his nation and subsequently the nation history of the world. This morning the Bible reading is continuing from yesterday's uh, reading from the book of Joshua and it's chapter 5 and reading from verses 2 to the end. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Haraloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them, all the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war 
who died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who had come out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war, who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcision, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and passed grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Cana. Canaan that year. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow. They've just crossed the river. They've set up the cairn or the monument or the uh, reminder of God's faithfulness up to that moment. But there is one thing that is missing, and that is that the older generation that had left Egypt to come had been circumcised according to the word of God. Moses had had all the males circumcised. However, during their wanderings in the wilderness, the children that were born were not circumcised according to the law of the Lord. So in a sense, we can say that the people of Israel were disobedient that did not fulfill the law. Now, the circumcision was a, uh, was a mark in the flesh that was a mark of the covenant people of God. It was part of what was done to say that you are part of that generation, of that work of God and of the people of God. But none of them had been made part of that because the older generation had neglected to draw the next generation into that covenant of grace and covenant of faithfulness. Now that does not stop God being faithful to his promises to the people of Israel. It doesn't stop God working with them and through them and bringing them into the promised land to establish them in the place that God has brought them to. But the moment that they have settled in the land or they've come into the land, they have to stop. And then God commands Joshua 
to create to prepare the flint knives and then use them to circumcise all the males in the land. Now, I don't know about you, but if they were surrounded by enemies that were looking for a moment when they would be weak and unable to fight, that was the moment. That was the moment for them to have come. They lay themselves vulnerable to the enemy. But God protects them. He does not let that situation arise as they are obedient to the commandment of the Lord. And then, of course, we have following right on that. God says to them, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Soon as those people that had come out from Egypt, who were born in the wilderness and had come into the promised land, entered into that covenant by receiving the sign of the covenant, the mark of the covenant in their flesh, God says to them, today I have rolled away the approach of Egypt from you. So when Paul talks to the believers in the, in the New Testament about baptism, being dead to sin and rising to Christ, it's a reminder that God through Christ on the cross has taken away the, uh, the, the reproach of sinful life and the old me. And in Christ, I am now a new creation. I inherit the land. I inherit the promises of God as a new creation. All things are passed away. Look, all things are becoming new. And then, and then they sit down to the memorial feast, the first Passover in the land of Canaan. The last ones they had had were on the move in the desert. But here in the land, they celebrate once again the, the memorial and the remembrance of God's faithfulness, of God working on their behalf to bring them out of the slavery in Egypt and not only to redeem them from the slavery, but to give them a land as an inheritance and bring them into that inheritance. And so they celebrate the Passover at their time. And the interesting thing it says is that the day that they ate of the produce of the land, because they used the seeds to create the, uh, the, the unleavened bread and cakes, and they used parched grains from the land for the, for the Passover. And Joshua tells us, the writer of Joshua tells us, that the day that they did that, the manna ceased. You know, the manner that God had provided all the way through the wilderness, every day through the wilderness, so that they would be able to eat and be nourished. The moment that they ate, ate of the fruit of the land, the produce of the land, the manna ceased, because now there is no longer any need for manna. Now is the time for tilling the land, for growing the produce, for eating it. God's provision continues just in a different way. And then, of course, we have this example, the, the story of Joshua and the commander of the Lord's army. So when we read the first part of the provision, it's just, if I can just spiritualize that a bit to say, when we come into that place of inheritance that God has called us to, the place that God has prepared for us, we might we, it is important for us to remember the covenant that God has made with us through Jesus Christ. And in that covenant were well, not just all the 40-year-old males, but there were the little 8-year-old boys as well. There was a sense of that now they are having to own the covenant for themselves. They cannot rely on their parents' covenant uh, keeping, the keeping of their parents' covenant with God. Somebody has said, God has no grandchildren. If anyone is a child of God, if anyone receives Jesus' personal savior and lives with him, he is a child of God. He's not a grandchild of God. We cannot live our lives trusting in the faith of somebody else. We cannot live our lives trusting in the activity of somebody else. 
we have to experience that grace and that provision for ourselves. And just like the people leaving Egypt had to exp experience God's mighty hand in bringing them out of Egypt, so to the people of I the generation, this generation of the people of Israel had experienced God bringing them across the Jordan River into the promised land, not out of Egypt, but into the promised land. And so each one of us has to be in that place of receiving the work of God in our lives for ourselves and being able to offer to him the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving or being able to enter into that covenant with Christ who died upon the cross of Calvary for us. And then we have the latter part of the chapter where Joshua is going out. He lifts up his eyes and look and behold there's a man standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua walks up to him and he says, tell me, are you for us or against us? He doesn't know whether this man has come to stand in support of the Israeli army or whether he has come to oppose it, like we will see later Goliath doing to the, uh, to the armies of Saul. But the, he replies, he says, I'm neither, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. In other words, if you are for the Lord, not if I'm for you, but are you for the Lord? I am for the I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. And many theologians believe that this is a theophany, because of chapter six. When we look about uh, uh, look at that, and they and they realize, uh, sorry, chapter at the end of chapter five, where he says, "Take off your your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. The only place that can be holy is where God is." And Joshua's not aware of that. But as he falls down and worships, and he says, are you for us or against us? I'm neither, I'm the captain of the Lord's army. And then he says, take off your shoes from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua is obedient. It is easy for us to fall down on our feet, on our faces before the Lord in worship. It's easy to give ourselves over to worship where we are not concerned about what's happening around us, but we are just lost in that worship and praise. But God is more concerned about us standing in the holy place, obedient to him and saying, we are your servants. We, believe, we obey your will. O oh Lord. And the taking off of the shoes was important because shoes, one, shoes were dirty, but also taking off your shoes den denoted the fact that you were the slave or the uh, of the person in whose presence you were standing. You didn't wear your shoes in the presence of a high ranking officer or someone that you knew. It was a symbol of his submission to God. And so for us today, we can do everything. We can be in the presence of the Lord. We can even ask him and receive an answer. But God is always calling us to holiness, calling us to live out that, uh, that um, covenant that he has made with us through Jesus Christ the covenant of salvation, the covenant of grace, the covenant of his love, a covenant that speaks to us, that we are the Lord's. Sometimes I like to think of God as being my personal possession, you know. It's easy to do that. But actually, God, we are not God's possession. He, well, sorry, he is not our possession we are God's possession. We are his household. We have been bought with a price. We belong to him. And our submission leads us to holiness. And holiness literally obeying his will. 
doing what he has called us to do, living our lives within that, irrespective of our circumstances or where we find ourselves, because he has brought us into his land. He has brought us into the land of his promise. Let us pray. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord, our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb, that was slain. For with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, family and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb be worship and praise, dominion and splendor for ever and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We turn to our collects for today. And the collect for, the season, for commemorating John and Charles Wesley. O God of mercy, who inspired John and Charles Wesley with zeal for your gospel, grant to all people boldness to proclaim your word and a heart ever to rejoice in singing your praises. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen and the collect for Pentecost taken from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you reveal the way of eternal life to every race and nation. Pour out this gift anew, that by the preaching of the gospel your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he justified, suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Master Carpenter of Nazareth, on the cross through wooden nails you wrought our full salvation. Wield well your tools in this your workshop, that we who come to you rough-hewn may be fashioned into a truer beauty by your hand, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God, world without end. Amen. And so, Lord, we pray together for the needs that we have on our hearts. We pray for the people and the situations. And we ask, Lord, that you receive the cry of our heart on their behalf as we intercede and ask you and seek you to work in, in, in that situation and in those people's lives. We pray for peace in our world where there is war and we pray that, Lord, that the hostages might be released in Gaza. We pray that evil might be stamped out of the hearts of men and women. And that there might be a true work of grace, Lord, as your church within that land proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for Ukraine and Russia for the many mothers and families whose loved ones are not returning. 
we pray for the church in Iran facing persecution and struggling. We pray for the suffering church throughout the world wherever it exists. We pray Heavenly Father for your church in this land to arise and be strong. We pray for a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit that will blow away the cobwebs and the dust of our sinfulness and Lord where we have departed from your paths we pray that you would bring conviction and repentance and where we walk in your ways Lord we seek more grace to continue to walk and continue to be a witness. Lord, may we see the provision of God in every part of our lives. And that like Joshua, Lord, be able to come face to face with you and fall before you and offer up our lives as an offering of sacrifice and praise. So that you might be able to receive our obedience and our submission, that you might be glorified through it and that, Lord, we might see the goodness of the Lord in the land of our generation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the needy, for the sick, for the suffering, for the sorrowful and the mourning. Lord, we pray that each person, you know their needs, you know what they need at this moment and we pray that Father you would release into their lives and into your body such an amazing outflowing of your love and grace that knowing the touch of the Lord on their, hand, on their lives they might grow into the fullness of what you want for each one of them. Lord we bring before you those who are struggling with cancer for some there is hope and they are turning things around. For others it seems like a one-way street. But we pray, Lord, have your will among them. Fulfill your purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so we say, Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you for the privilege of partnership in the gospel for us opportunities to live for Jesus and speak for Jesus in the company of others, to demonstrate the love of Christ to those around me in humble service, and for open doors for his word to proclaim him faithfully. To Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining Phil and myself this week for prayers. And Jennifer has been with me as well. And we hope that they have been a blessing to you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Monday at 10 o'clock when we come back together for morning prayer. Uh, Sunday we meet at 10.30 for, on Trinity Sunday for, for Holy Communion. Uh, so do join us at St. Peter's if you're able to or go to a local church wherever you are celebrating the fact that God, the triune God, has reached out in love to each one of us. Till we meet again either in person on Sunday or online on Monday, all that remains for me is to say goodbye and God bless.